So good afternoon, Sweden and Europe, and good morning, New York. And welcome to this event organized by NASDAQ and the Swedish House of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. My name is Gabriel Örvitz, and I'm the chair of the Swedish House of Finance. For those of you who do not know Swedish House of Finance, we are Sweden's national research center in financial economics and aim to be an independent platform where academia, the private and public financial sectors can meet to exchange knowledge and foster new ideas within the field of finance. We are here today to talk about how companies are working with diversity, gender and minority issues to become successful. As a side comment, I was brought up by my late mother who attended the Stockholm School of Economics in 1943 to 1946. I think there were six or seven women in her class. So I've experienced close by the gender issue. We are happy, very happy to start the conversation with a fireside chat with Idina Friedman, president and CEO of Nasdaq, moderated by Frederick Ekstrom, president Nasdaq Stockholm. Following the fireside chat, we will have a roundtable discussion, but I will come back to that. So please, the floor is yours, Idina and Friedrich. Thank you very much, Gabriel, and, and thank you very much, Swedish House of Finance, for co-hosting this event with us. Um, good morning, Idina. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, Frederick? It's great to see you. Uh, good. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit on your background and your NASDAQ journey before we dive into the topic of diversity? Sure, sure. Well, I, uh, I grew up in a city called Baltimore in uh, Maryland in, in the US, and uh, I ended up at NASDAQ right after I graduated from business school uh, as an intern. And then I was able to parlay that into a permanent job at the end of the summer. Um, and I've been at NASDAQ almost my entire career. So I started there in 1993. NASDAQ at the time was still kind of a budding U.S. exchange, equities exchange. And then I uh, had various roles throughout the organization, um, ultimately leading the data business as well as uh, becoming head of corporate strategy and then CFO. Uh, I left for three years and went to the Carlisle Group as their CFO and when they went public. Um, and then I came back to, to NASDAQ in 2014 as president. Um, and then ultimately in 2017, I was named CEO. So it's been, uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to be at, at an organization that has challenged me and given me opportunities throughout my career, but it's also just a great, great company. And I, you know, I think we have a great mission. So happy to be here today. Great. Um, I, I think here, here in Sweden, thinking about NASDAQ, it's mainly as an exchange operator of the Stockholm Stock Exchange and some other exchanges in the Nordic, but also, of course, the, the U.S. exchange. But, I mean, NASDAQ has transformed during these 50 years that have been uh, active, and especially during your journey. So how, how would you describe NASDAQ today as a company? Sure. Well, today, NASDAQ is a global technology company that serves the capital markets. We, um, we are an exchange operator in the U.S. and in the Nordics, and we're extremely proud of that foundation. But we also now, because actually of our, um, our acquisition of OMEX and all the work that OMEX did before we acquired them, we are now a, a very large-scaled technology provider to 130 other markets around the world. We also have a very large index business with about $350 billion of assets under management tied to our index products. Um, and we also have a data and analytics business that serves the investment management community with really important intelligence to help them attract assets to their funds and provide competitive analysis. So we, I feel that we are um, a scale technology provider, but we, are, we always remember that our foundation is our exchanges and um, we're extremely proud of the work that we do as an exchange operator in the Nordics as well as in the U.S. Thanks. Now, now the warm up is done, Adina. Now we're going <laughs> to the more tougher question. Um, so, diving into the topic a little bit, ESG is of high focus in the society and the financial market, and and that is very good. And it ranges all the way from sustainable investment, social impact, and corporate governance. And within that umbrella, you also have diversity and gender equality. But but why is this important for you and for Nasdaq? Well, I think first of all, I I, I do want to say we are extremely fortunate that we are a part of the Nordic markets because of the fact, and, and the Nordics really have led the world in ESG investing and a focus on sustainability. 
Um, it's really it's really embedded in the culture of the Nordics to to be uh, very very mindful of our impact on the world. And I think that that part of our culture has really emanated throughout Nasdaq. And we're, we're very fortunate, honestly, to have that as part of our culture, because then we've been able to focus on issues of ESG, uh, I think, earlier than other exchanges. I think that the, the why it's important, of course, is that we, we all have to recognize that a corporate, the corporate world and the public sector have, have to work together to create a sustainable economy for, for the, global, the global economy. And we also have to recognize that we're not, um, we're not, we don't exist to meet the numbers for the next quarter. We exist to make an impact on the world over a long period of time. And we can make a positive impact or we can make a negative impact. And I think that we, I think we all, I think many corporates in Europe and the US now have come to a full recognition that part of our role is to make a positive impact. And I think that what's been great about the ESG movement is that it's become quite mature in Europe, but it has kind of come, because of all of the maturity in Europe, it's kind of come roaring into the U.S. as well. And, and U.S. has played a very fast catch up to the need for companies to focus on all stakeholders as part of their role um, as well. You know, so, and I always say it's an and, not an or. Focus on your shareholders, but focus on um, other aspects of your community, your employees, your suppliers, your clients. If you do all of that, obviously you will end up um, providing the right long-term outcome for your shareholders. So I, I think it's just a, it's an obvious area of focus for us, but it's become an area of focus for all of cor the corporates in the US and Europe. And it's a very important movement. So if we zoom in a little bit on diversity and gender equality, what, what are some of the actions and initiatives that NASDAQ has ongoing within this space? Well, if we take a step back and say, why does diversity matter in the world of corporates? I think we, it's, it's, it's an obvious answer, but it's, at the same time, it's still an education in some, um, some sectors. So the obvious answer is, of course, that our customers are diverse. Um, and so if we do the right job of serving our customers, then we will obviously have long-term success as a business. Now, how do you make sure that you're serving a diverse set of customers is to make sure your company, um, inside the company, you have proper diversity so that you get those different points of view. You, you get an understanding of the people you're serving. Um, and those, those employees can really help drive the company forward to be able to serve those diverse clients. I think that also, of course, as a, you know, if we want to have sustainable capitalism over the long term, we have to make sure that capitalism works for all of society and not just some of society. Uh, and so we have been focused on something we call cooperative capitalism, which is really making sure that we have the best of capitalism. Not, not, you know, companies can be extremely nimble in serving clients. Uh, the government has large issues and problems and, and opportunities to, to solve. So how can companies work with the government to really further the economy and further society together. And, and if we can do that successfully, I feel like we can have a very sustainable capitalist society. Um, and, but a large part of that is making sure that opportunity is available to all and not just to some. So that's kind of, to me, the foundation of why diversity matters inside of companies and matters in terms of how companies are being led. Um, and therefore, NASDAQ, uh, one of the initiatives that we have in the U.S. is to a proposal, a diversity proposal, that's focused on um, the disclosure of the diversity of corporate boards. So every company, our proposal is that every company that lists on NASDAQ would be required annually to provide a table to their investors that demonstrates the diversity of their board members. And then also we've set an objective that over the next four years, we're asking our companies to reach two diverse board members um, within their organizations. But if they don't reach that, that objective, their only obligation is to explain to shareholders why they haven't been able to reach it, or maybe they just don't agree with, the, with that objective. So they can also explain it that way. So we call that a have or explain rule. Um, and so it's really trying to move and encourage companies to move forward in having their board look more like their employees, look more like their clients, um, and, 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 and at the same time, not doing it with a hard quota. So that's the US initiative. 
I think in Europe and Sweden and in all many Nordic countries, there's been more progress on this issue than there has been in the US. And um, Frederick, maybe you could actually provide the, we were talking about um, what's happened in Sweden and kind of where have we gotten in Sweden on the gender diversity of boards? And maybe you could provide a little bit of insight on that. Yes, if we look into the gender equality over like a 10 year period, I think we have had good development in terms of uh, the Swedish market and corporate, but it has become slower. And actually when we looked at the report for 2020, it was even reversed in some areas. So, so we felt like we, we needed to put focus on this again. Uh, we need to continue with education and help corporate in their journey uh, on this progress. So we partner with an expert organization called Albright and also with the Swedish Venture Capital Association to provide a platform for education around gender equality and diversity. And we will actually have the first educational session already now in March. And then we hope to have four or five educational sessions this year, evaluate and move forward and hopefully move the needle and get more progress also in the area of the Nordic because it has slowed down and we want to get momentum back. But it's interesting, Frederick. I, I think that's terrific. I think that the, the what's interesting to me is that you, the Swedish government worked with the exchange to come out with a standard of disclosure plus encouragement is what I would call it, like kind of setting a goal for the country to reach, I think, 40 percent representation of women. And it, and I think when they made when they set that goal, it was at about 24 percent representation. And I believe that in Sweden, it's gotten to 34 percent over the period. Is that right? Yeah, so it, it, it was through the governance code that we have. We have this tradition of self-regulation and the governance code. And in that, there were these targets. And you're right, we are at around 34, 35%, but, but it's slowing down a little bit. And, and I actually think that by now, we would have hoped to reach the targets of the 40%. So I think it's time to, to see if we can get some more momentum in, in to, to this. And what I really like about the approach that Sweden has taken is that they've done it through a disclosure regime and then encouragement and these setting goals and targets to try to encourage companies to really focus on it and make it a part of their governance practices, um, but not having it be a hard quota. And I think, you, you know, there has been progress, but I agree, it has been slowing down. And so if, if there can be this renewed um, focus on it, I think that that 40% is quite attainable. And of course, it's always important to remember that you know, women make uh, comprise at least half of the population. So to get to 40% isn't quite parity, but it's a, it's a, it's a really long way. Um, the US has, is, is for much further behind on that. So I think that we have an opportunity in the US to kind of take the lessons of Sweden and try to apply them through the NASA proposal. And I think when we announced our partnership with, with Allbright and the Swedish uh, Capital Venture Association, that generated positive feedback all, all the time. Of course, it's, it's a very good topic. But when you proposed in the US, uh, was that how was the reaction of the community with your board diversity proposal? Well, I, well, so the way that it works in the US is when we want to change a listing rule, we propose it to the SEC, which is the equivalent of the FSA in the US. And the SEC then has to approve it. So it goes out, what happens is we submit the proposal and it goes out for comments. We then su uh, submit a response to all of those comments and any amendments that we want to make. And then it goes out for comment again, if we've made amendments. We are in the, at the end of the first comment period and we have gotten over 200 or actually 190 comments. 83% of them are positive. 17% uh, of them are negative. Some of the negative comments are that we don't, we're not going far enough. And others are that we really, this is, this is not what you know, certain people wanna see us doing. Um, but in the media, it's been a different, a different interest, a uh, different issue. So uh, you've seen certain media outlets be quite negative on the proposal um, and other media outlets really stand up and be very positive towards the proposal. So there's been more of a polarized, I would say coverage of the proposal in the media but when you really look at the comments, the comments are overwhelmingly positive. And most of those comments are coming from the investment management community um, because investors want standardized data and they want to encourage companies towards more diversity. And this proposal does both of those things in a way that they agree it's a good um, market-led solution instead of a government-led solution. <clears throat> so I, I have to say, I think it's been an interesting reaction we did expect a debate, um, but the, the media attention has been more, more polarized than we expected. 
Okay, it's going to be very interesting to follow uh, this. Um, in addition to the board diversity initiative, uh, NASDAQ has something called the purpose initiative. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, the purpose initiative, I mean, kind of the board diversity initiative in a way is, is, is uh, tied to the purpose of NASDAQ. So NASDAQ's purpose is to drive inclusive growth and prosperity. And I think it's important to recognize the word inclusive because I think, as I said before, the best way for the U.S. to create a sustainable capitalist society is to make sure that we are focused on giving more opportunity to more people. Uh, and so as part of our purpose initiative, um, our purpose initiative is really to, what I would say, activate our purpose, uh, both within the businesses and making sure that as we drive our businesses forward, we're thinking about our purpose and, and we're keep staying focused on that purpose as being a market operator and a technology provider. And so, for instance, of course, you know, our job, as you know, very well know, Frederick, is we, we want to uh, maximize access and minimize friction within the markets because we want to democratize the capital markets and make investing available to everyone. And if we can do that and, and make it so that more and more of our communities are equity owners and are invested in, in the future of commerce, I think that we'll find that more of them get lifted up over time, particularly over the long term, and, and it's, a, it's a wealth creation event for everyone. But we, so one of the things we've done is um, we are focused on financial literacy and investing education, investment education. Um, and we're really trying to figure out through the foundation how we bring that to more underserved communities. And then also we have the Entrepreneur Center, which we've now taken into a global um, application, online application, where it's free education for entrepreneurs all over the world um, to allow them to understand how to grow and, and create a sustainable business that hopefully one day they take to the public markets. And, 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 and would you say in general that, that this sort of corporate purpose has become more important for a corporate long-term success? Oh, definitely. I, well, I would say, you know, there are many companies that have been purpose-driven for a long time. Um, and we have been purpose-driven for a very long time. I think, though, that there's a lot more attention being drawn to those companies that have had, that really are walking the talk is probably the right way to say it. It's one thing to say that you're purpose-driven. It's another thing to demonstrate that you're purpose-driven. So I think investors are holding companies to a higher standard today of what are they doing to demonstrate that their purpose is true and that they're staying true to their purpose. Um, and I think that the, uh, companies are getting rewarded when they can demonstrate that they have a very strong purpose, that it's driving their long-term strategy and that they're demonstrating the, uh, the purpose every day in the way that they operate the business. And you're seeing money flow to those companies that can really show that on, a day, on an everyday basis. Um, so while I think there's always been a lot of purpose behind many corporates, I think the investor attention towards purpose has been highly elevated through the ESG movement. And I do think it's a sustainable part of what, what corporates should focus on in the future. And, and in terms of sort of equality and diversity, what would you say has changed the most during your career uh, within the financial markets? Yeah, it's, well, I can speak from my own experience as a woman in the industry, but I, I have to say, I think that we've made a lot of progress for, for women in the financial industry. Um, I think that we have a long way to go. Um, in terms of really creating an inclusive culture for people from all diverse backgrounds, I, I think that we're we're much further behind in our in the in all, the way that we are attracting and retaining talent from every diverse background. But if as a woman in the industry, uh, I have to say I've had a great career at Nasdaq and and at Carlisle. Um, I've never felt held back from my ambitions ever. Um, I've actually been propelled forward in a couple of cases that uh, people took risks on me, and I. I really appreciated that and I worked very hard to prove that they were right. Um, but I also would say that not every woman in the industry has had the experience I've had and not every, you know, not every company is like NASDAQ. So the thing that I've seen that's been really interesting over, think of it as 30 years. So back in the 80s, um, the financial industry had, uh, it was very clear that there was some really bad behavior in the industry. And it came to light and it got a lot of, like a spotlight was shined on the challenges that women had in the industry. And so I would say that at that point, CEOs started to say, well, we have to put in policies and practices that curb this behavior and start to 
move the companies forward. And so I'd say that that was in the, in the CEO's head, but it wasn't in their heart yet. Um, when we, you know, in the 90s, you started to see women have more opportunity, get, get um, a further up in the chain, and, and, but it was just starting. And then as you, the next generation of leaders came into the industry, you started to see it go from the head to the heart. And once that happens, then it's not just a matter of policies and practices, it really becomes a matter of culture. And I think that um, I have seen leaders in the industry work very hard to really shape their culture to give more women more opportunities and to make it so that women can get to the top. So we now in the U.S. have, um, you know, a woman running one of the largest banks in the world. She actually starts, I think, next week, uh, Jane Frazier. But we also see a whole range of women right below the CEO ranks running major parts of the, um, the industry. So it's, a, it's, it's pretty exciting to see how much change, but recognize that's 30 years I'm talking about. Change doesn't happen overnight. So our next step is obviously to continue that progress and to make sure that that equal opportunity truly becomes equal, um, but also to really focus now on other elements of diversity and to make sure that we make those same shifts to make it so everyone in the community feels that our industry is a place that they can thrive. Thank you. And, and, and to finalize this, this chat a little bit, 2020 was a very special year and challenging year for many individuals and corp corporates. I mean, as, as a global leader for a company that exists in all parts of the world, I mean, what is your biggest sort of challenge and focus area uh, going into 2021 now where, when we're still impacted by the pandemic? It was a very interesting year, 2020. I, you know, the challenges that we we experienced as it, within the company, uh, just in terms of keeping all of our employees safe while still running our markets in the most heightened volume environment that we've seen ever, um, as well as making sure that our our other exchange clients continue to get the support that they needed to be able to run their markets, and to continue to have a a positive culture, a positive spirit within the firm. Um, is it's been you know it's been a really challenging year, but one that I'm I feel very proud of the fact that Nasdaq um, all over the world, both in the U.S. and in the Nordics, as well as in our global operations, have continued to serve our clients very well um, and and operate the markets well uh, while staying while moving everyone to a remote environment. But 2021 is going to be a different challenge. We're already in that world now, and it's a it's a long winter as we know. But as we emerge into the spring, people are going to you know, want to get back together, you've also got the vaccine starting to roll out. So the question is, when are we going to be able to reemerge and reconvene and get together again and, and kind of have a sense of normalcy? Is it going to be the summer? Is it going to be the fall? But let's say that it's the second half of this year. Um, what does that mean for the future of work? We have people now who enjoy working from home, um, other people who can't wait to get back. <laughs> so how do we create the proper hybrid environment and maintain this cultural spirit that we're trying to maintain and hopefully introduce more flexibility into the workplace. I, I'm actually excited to offer more flexibility because I actually think that the flexibility is going to make it so that more women have more opportunity throughout their careers and they're going to feel less strained and stressed um, during those, those, those really challenging years of having the kids at home. So I, I'm really hopeful that we can come out stronger and offer more opportunity to more people with a hybrid model going forward. Thank you, Adina. And, and, and thank you very much for prioritizing this discussion this morning. It, it, to be honest, it, it's a little bit scary interviewing your own CEO, but I think we did fine. And, and I <laughs> did a great, a lot no, it was awesome. <laughs> so with that, we have a great panel following this. So thank you very much again, Adina. And I'll leave it back to you, Gabriel. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much, Adina and Frederick. And Adina, we really appreciate your participation. So thank you very much. It was very interesting to listen to both of you. Now we move on to uh, the panel. Uh, we have a high caliber panel. Uh, I will shortly introduce them uh, with representatives from Swedish industry. Uh, when we will discuss a number of different issues on gender and minority issues and how successful companies are dealing with these issues. During the round table or panel discussion, we will give you who are listening in the opportunity to, to answer some of your questions. To ask a question, please write in the Q&A box. 
I, will also, I would also like to inform you that the event is being recorded and published on our website and social media platforms. So let me introduce this uh, high caliber panel. We have Vivica hildman rudberg Head of Corporate Communication Sustainability from Investor AB. Maria Hamstedt, Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer, SEB. Selina Milstam, Head of Global Talent Management, Ericsson. Julie Lynn Tegland, Managing Partner, Europe, Middle East, India and Africa from EY. And Anna Stenberg, Chief People and Platform Officer from Chinevik. So all of you, welcome. Uh, let me kick off with a sort of a high um, level question. Is there a difference between the ownership and management perspective regarding gender and minority issues? Why is the ownership focus on these issues important? Maybe we could start with Vivica, if you could start that mm. question. Then we uh, Hello, everyone, and I hope uh, you can hear me now. Uh, can you? Yes, yes. good. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, investor being uh, such a large owner, for us, this is really uh, why we engage in diversity and inclusion is very much because we think that diverse perspective people with different backgrounds, different competences, together when they, they bring different perspectives to the table and take better decisions, i.e. drive better performance in the companies, i.e. drive the long-term competitiveness of the companies. So that's why it's such a critical issue for us as owners. Okay, anyone else would like to comment? Uh, feel free to yeah. jump in. I'll be happy to comment as well. Anna, yes. I mean, for us, you know, it's, again, it's always, you know, the tone from the top uh, in terms of ownership, no matter which uh, industry, which sector uh, is super important in, all, in order to really make sure to, you know, get the values, the message out there and really say, you know, send that signal to the organization. And for us, um, it's all about making sure that, you know, more diverse organizations, more diverse portfolio companies will really help us grow our businesses uh, faster and better. So for us, it's business critical to have diver a diverse organization as Shinami and also for our portfolio companies. So the tone from the top is super important in terms of ownership. Um, I'm also wanna say that, you know, just 10 years ago, this was more of an HR issue it was HR driving the diversity discussion in all organizations. And then a couple of years after it actually became a more strategic uh, topic that entered also into the management team's agendas, which was great. It became a strategic business critical question. And now it has also become an owner, uh, an owner topic, which is amazing because then we get that 360 you know, focus on this. And that's gonna make a big difference as well. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Julie, do you want like to comment or you are muted? We don't hear you. No, you are muted. I don't know. Does it work now? Now it works. Fine. Wonderful. Gabriel, Good. this is this is such an amazing topic, and I, I really want to build on what Vivek and Anna said. I I run a partnership business globally, and I'm responsible across quite a bit of, more than Europe. That partnership business means that my partners have an interest in the business as an owner, but we're also working with all industries. And I have to say there's been a huge mindset change over the past 15 years in the concept of diversity. We don't just see it as a nice thing to do or the right thing to do. We see it as a business necessity. And while I know there's lots of arguments out there as to how good the research is, we can show based on our teams that when they're diverse, they reach better results, they work better together and they get better answers. And Gabrielle, maybe something that's really important, they also have more fun. I can say that just being in a group of everybody that looks like you isn't as fun as being with people that are different, even if we have to acknowledge that it's harder. So I think it's something that's impacting the financial results of the owners, studies still to be proven, but also 
wider business needs to acknowledge it gives it that extra pizzazz, that fun, that necessity, and then the economics to back it. Okay. Uh, Celine or Maria, would you like to make any comments on this issue? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you well. Yes. Uh, and I think, uh, I mean, I agree with everything that has been said, but, you know, to add on uh, also the world that we're living in with, you know, the higher complexity and the uncertainty of uh, what is right and the agreement of actually what is right to do today in order to be right tomorrow. And I think just looking at our business being in the banking and banking today and banking tomorrow, I mean, it's getting something totally different. And that's also reasons in how can you actually meet this? And that is by bringing in more perspectives uh, that you might not have already in the company, uh, just to mitigate the things that is ca coming, flying at you, I think, today uh, in the transformation of different parts of the business. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Selina, do you have any comments on this and how Ericsson looks at this issue? Uh, <laughs> oh, how Ericsson well, yeah. versus ownership perspective. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think my colleague said it very well. But at the end of the day, one of the things that we learned in the past twelve months is actually that change does and can happen overnight if the incentive is big enough and if those who are in power and for this audience holding the money make the decisions to invest in the ways that the research that has just been highlighted has uh, indicated is the best way to run a business, so. Okay, let's move to the next question. Thank you all. Uh, could we, I was a university professor at Columbia in New York in the middle and late 70s in, in finance. And my, uh, my female students at that time I'm quite old, as you can understand. My female students at that time got really the best jobs. So I felt at that time that the US was far ahead of, of Sweden when it came to sort of uh, gender issues, especially within the financial community. Could we briefly discuss if you see significant cultural differences between the US and Sweden when it comes to the gender issue? I know a lot of things have happened over these last 40 years, not least in Sweden. So who would like to, maybe Julie, you would like to kick off here. I'd, I'd love to kick off. I see major differences. I have to say, I think Sweden has surpassed the US by far on the gender issue. There's much more board representation. There's a true spirit of equality in Sweden that I think the US can only dream of. But I would say it's not just about the gender issue. It's also about looking at inclusion. And there, I think we all have we all have progress to make, Gabrielle. So if I look across a big difference, clearly Sweden is way ahead on gender. And I, I think that's something that as, as a originally born American, I would say, I don't think we've made the progress that we should have made over the last 40 years. I think Sweden has done very well. I'm not saying there's not more to do, especially in middle management, but I think we've all got to join, join forces and do something on the inclusivity front. That's how I would leave my comments, Gabrielle. Anna, do you have a comment on this? We can't hear you. you yeah, I, I, fully, I agree. Uh, but we do definitely have a lot to learn also from the US. For example, if I look at our the, the US companies in Shinovik's portfolio, they are also ahead of the game and have come a long way in terms of measuring and setting targets for other diversity elements and other dimensions of diversity in terms of ethnicity and so on. And there we have a lot to learn in Sweden and in the Nordic countries. I think we have been a little bit reluctant actually uh, putting measures and defining these other diversity elements uh, because of restrictions and so on. So we have to become a more proactive and being more bold in terms of setting, setting those targets and measuring other areas except for gender as well. Of course, gender is easy to measure and it was a good starting point, but we still have a long way to go in terms of the other areas. Selena, now your, your camera is off, but how does a really truly global company like Ericsson that are in all, all kinds of countries all over the world, how do you look at this issue? Uh, we somehow lost Selena. I don't know what happened. 
Let's go to Vivica, meanwhile. Please, Vivica, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I would just like to, uh, I agree with all of you. Uh, we are uh, pretty, uh, pretty good when it comes to uh, gender. At least we have improved over the past decades. But then there's this uh, issue around inclusion and diversity in a broader sense. I think it's also... Uh, we have a very informal structure, an informal way of leadership in Sweden. And sometimes that sort of uh, people feel excluded instead of included because the... Uh, the, uh, the car decisions actually yeah. taken. How... Uh, do, uh, and I think those issues needs to be discussed also in Sweden because it's it's sort of a hinder when it comes to in increasing inclusion. Vivica, yes, inclusion could I just ask you, so I understand, you are talking about sort of our leadership style or model that somehow... Uh... Yeah, and I think that it has an impact on uh, also diversity and inclusion in a broader sense. And we need to think about that in order to move ahead also uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion. Thanks. Anyone who would like to comment? Uh, Mia or? Yes. Uh, and I, uh, I come from another perspective. Um, I'm not sure that uh, most women uh, actually feel that we are better in Sweden in comparison to the US while you're in uh, or working within Sweden. Uh, and I think it's part of what you are on also to Vivica that you might be in a position, but are you really included or are you in the succession for, you know, the next position and so forth. So um, I'm not really sure uh, that Sweden are so much ahead uh, when it comes to actually including women uh, in comparison to the US. Okay. How have we lost Selena? Is she not there any longer? Which is very sad because Ericsson is such an amazing company. So it somehow we seem to have lost Selena. I'm, I'm sorry for that. We'll see if she can come back. Okay, let's. I have a follow up question on this. Uh, yeah, Selena doesn't seem to be. Are, are you there, Selena? No, doesn't. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to be working. I am. I am back. Oh, fine. <laughs> Uh, the, you know, okay. did you hear the conversation? And you, I mean, Ericsson being such a global company, what's your perspective on on US versus Sweden or or the rest of the world? Also, I mean, since you are dealing in all markets. Yes. Well, um, un unfortunately, I think that in Sweden we haven't come as far as we'd like to believe we have come, uh, having been 15 years, I still see that we're struggling with um, updating our policies, updating the consequences in our society and updating culture in general um, in organizations around that inclusiveness that's necessary, not only for women, but for all minorities across Sweden. So I think when we start to look at the data, we made significant progress in Sweden with those policies in the 70s. And unfortunately, I think we've stagnated, despite having more progressive policies around uh, parental leave and um, I think doggies, like the childcare system is a great example where we've helped women. But I still see that there's uh, those actually, unfortunately, contribute some degree to a glass ceiling that's here. Okay. I have a follow-up question to this question, and that is, has the focus in Sweden on board representation rather than management careers, I mean, middle management, top management, has, has that been the right approach to the gender issue? Myself, I always felt that there was a bit too strong focus on board and less on sort of real management careers for women. No one wants to comment on well, this. I can comment. I, <laughs> yeah, Anna, I, go ahead. <laughs> all initiatives, I would say all initiatives that will drive this uh, topic are, are good. Um, however, I agree with you that it has to be a much bigger focus on the 
operational levels. How can we get more women into operational roles? Because then we get even more women uh, in the talent pool for the board roles, which is of course also important. However, I think in general, when it comes to the debate, um, I think the biggest <laughs> focus has been on why this is important rather than talking about how. And when you talk about the operational roles, it automatically becomes more natural to talk about how to improve diversity. So we have to become even more concrete. We have to become much more solution oriented when we talk about diversity and really look into how we can inject DNI into the work streams, into our processes, because then we will actually get DNI, you know, part of uh, of the company cultures and, and part of our leadership. So I think focusing even more on the operational role will also help us solve that. I, Gabrielle, can I build on what Anna said? I thought she please, spoke please go extremely ahead. well, a great, great comment, Anna, and I agree. I think what people thought is we hire enough diversity in the early stages of most companies, actually, when we look across, there are a few exceptions, but most companies. And if we can do the board at the top, we make like a sandwich and we can work ourselves down. The problem is, is I, I agree with you, Anna, I think they forgot the how in the middle. And when we look at the middle, it takes quite a while to make sure that women have the right P&L responsibility type roles, not the easy roles, but the hard roles. And it's harder and takes longer to get them positioned in that. Gabrielle, I think they, they somehow forgot that piece in the middle. And if you look now, I think both in the US and in Sweden, that's where we can do more. And frankly, across the globe, that's where we need to do more to make sure that women are not just growing in their careers, that's obvious, but growing also into different parts of the business that give them different experiences to better qualify them. In a way, the focus on boards was almost the easy part, right? It's easy to find women towards the end of their career that have had a fantastic career because they've worked through it. There are a lot of them, but it's hard to get the level of critical mass you need to be represented in middle management who are willing to do that tough P&L responsible role, who are, who are there. They need to be developed and they need to be invested in. And I think people understand that now. I don't think it's possible to flip a switch and get it overnight. And, and I think later we'll be talking about hopefully I can learn something from this great panel as to what each of you are doing in that respect. Okay, anyone else would like to comment? I can just add to that because as owners, uh, about a year ago, we set targets on diversity and inclusion and we did that also with, on, on, we did that on, with a gender perspective and then we, we uh, for equal, uh, from a portfolio perspective, have equal uh, representation on the boards. But we also set targets on the management level. And why did we do that as owners? Because otherwise it's quite natural we target the board. But we did that in order to really drive change and in order to send that strong signal to all the companies that we have um, uh, engagement in. So uh, going back to uh, what all of, all of us are saying, it's both the board level and the operational level. And we as owners, we can also drive that change on the operational level. Okay. Uh, may, I have a question from, from the audience. Maybe we can sort of take uh, in between here. And the question uh, is as follows. In order to increase the pool of talent, we need to make the market, I suppose the commercial world is what's meaning, more interesting to young women and other minorities in school. How can we achieve that or can we achieve that? This is a long-term question. I don't know if you have any comments or agree with, with, with the questionnaire. Uh, okay, Anna, well, the to, oh, please go ahead, whoever wants. Yeah, yes. this is Selena. I, I, I think that this is a really important focus area for Ericsson, creating uh, an open talent market where there's an experience of fairness and transparency, where we talk a lot about, about creating that psychological and social safety where people can speak up, where we're not just talking about inclusion or talking about being passionate about diversity, but we're actually changing policies. We're actually implementing ways of working that are inclusive and, and not alienating any part of the um, population that is a talent for, 
for us a future potential talent. And I think that that's, you know, we talk a lot about allyship um, and men and their allyship, but it's really allyship for all of the talent and creating that fairness and opportunity um, for, for everyone. And I think that particularly the awareness that's being um, heightened in young people, people in university, I mean, they're choosing universities by those same selection price processes. So they're certainly going to be choosing organizations. And again, as the pandemic has taught us, we have an opportunity to leapfrog ourselves and create a new paradigm of work, a workplace, and the flexibility that enables much greater diversity and much more inclusion of anybody who is willing to work hard and is smart and wants to contribute to an organization. Anyone else would like to comment? I can just, just comment as well on the, the talent pool because we tend to kind of use the argument that the talent pool is narrow. We have to you know, educate more women into specific sectors and so on. But the talents are already out there. It's our own networks that have to be broadened. We have to, you know, go beyond those traditional networks where we usually source talents from on board level, on operational level, and so on. So we have to just stop using that argument that the talents aren't there. I mean, it, it definitely goes for board recruitments. Uh, you can never use the argument that there aren't enough women with enough experience for a certain board role. We saw that so clearly when we were setting targets for our investment team, uh, improving diversity there. It didn't took long until we really uh, reached, you know, our um, targets of 40, 60 balance between men and women on both investment team level, but also management team and, and board level. So if you just set the targets and really expand your talent pool, um, there are no excuses and you will be able to succeed. Anyone can else? I, yes, Julie. Can I add a, a different perspective? So I agree. And I, I think Mia wants to get in here too, if I saw her. Yeah, right. but I do that after you. So Okay. I just yes. saw you reach and I was thinking, yeah. I, I fully agree with what Selena and Anna said. And, and at the same time, I'm going to take a completely different perspective for just a second. Um, at EY, we're doing a lot around technology. I really think there's an opportunity to get a lot more women across the base in technology. And I'm not referring to, because I completely agree with Anna, I'm not referring to the already educated talent pool. I'm referring to motivating young girls ages 11 to 16 to really get excited about the fact that they can do things in that space, whether it's an AI or blockchain or coding or I, I don't care, but I would like to see more girls, especially young girls across many of our markets, be mm. willing to give it a try. And I know we say that, you know, everything is gender neutral, but when you're in school, it's, it's actually not. And so I, I really want to be cognizant of the fact, I think in some markets, we need to find a way to inspire a few. And I'm not specific to any industry, but at least across some of those STEM areas, I think there's more that we can do to get them excited about that. And I know, Selena, that's probably, you know, two generations before they try to join Ericsson or join mm -hmm. EY. But I, I think we all have a role to play about being role models, showing that, you know, it's, it's great to see senior women like us in that field. We can do it. And we've got to encourage our young girls to keep doing that. Technology will be more and more important in the future, which is why I said I, I don't care which industry it's in. But getting them those skills, I think, Gabrielle, is really important. And I think all of us, whether we're an owner business or what industry we have, we should be looking to inspire that future generation in some way. Maria, you wanted Agreed. to comment on this. Yeah, and I was into uh, the same as you, Julie, uh, that, uh, you know, also to use the power that we have uh, within the company that we are in. Mm -hmm. And how can we make it attractive to uh, people in the younger ages also to stay? Because at least in Sweden, we can see that, for instance, you know, uh, women that uh, graduate within the tech sector or the tech um, areas is also uh, reducing. So, so I think we do have an important part to uh, make us attractive and to do that early on. And we can do that. Uh, and that is also building the pool for our next generations to come to actually put some efforts in that. Okay. Thank you.
Could Can I, I just ask? very yes. briefly, very, sure. very briefly comment? I think we should not end up in that it's, it's a sort of a girl's problem or a women problem. It's, uh, uh, so it's both sexes. We have to work with the men, the perception of men in terms of what, do, uh, what are their unconscious biases, what are our, the women's uh, unconscious biases. It's not, let's not sort of, again, fall in the trap of, well, we need to role model the women, we need to teach them, we need to say them, this is the track you should take. Uh, instead, uh, confirm and acknowledge the women and all the capabilities we have and educate the men and train the men much more. Vivica, could I ask uh, maybe a, a bit provocative question? If I look of the people, I don't know exactly how many are attending now, but there were 430 people that said they were going to attend. More than 80% were women and less than 20% are men. Should, I mean, that to me seems uh, pretty provocative. It should be the other way around to my, you know, or at least 50-50. Why is it that, and I actually checked with my male colleagues, uh, you know, in Swedish business life, I asked a few questions. It seems that whenever there is a seminar or, or something around, and it has the, you know, within it, the title gender, they sort of, no, no, that's not for me. If we said how to develop human capital in companies, something like that, they, they, they would attend. I don't know if you have any comment on this, because it really relates to what you have discussed. I, I I think uh, it, it, we also have to make this whole discussion much more inclusive, just as we want to create a more inclusive business uh, environment. And uh, I think also there is a feeling out there that it is a little bit of a sensitive topic. And if you don't have all the answers, uh, if you're afraid of falling into a trap when you discuss this topic, then you prefer not to kind of stay out of it. So I think we have to, again, be more kind of inclusive there and more solution and positive and opportunity driven when we talk about the gender situation rather than just talking about the hinders and the problems and, you know, pointing finger at the companies who are not succeeding. Let's see how we can, you know, solve this together. And it's like also from an ownership perspective. For us uh, at Chinevik, it's super important not just to come with a lot of restrictions and requirements uh, to our portfolio companies. We want to also help them with the solutions and work this out together with them in a more welcoming and uh, proactive way. And I think by doing that and having that approach to this whole discussion, we will be more, uh, it will be easier to attract more men into this discussion as well. Anyone else would like to comment? Well, I, I would just say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Delina, go ahead, please. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, social anthropologist Margaret Mead, she said that words build worlds. And I think the language that we use around this topic are important. And I do think that uh, similar to what Anna said in mm. terms of having an appreciative lens, if we use data, if we use research, use behavioral science, and we engage in conversations around creating organizations that are more productive, uh, more effective, creating greater uh, um, return on, for investors and creating greater impact to society in general, then diversity and inclusion are at the heart of that since we if we're agreeing that the research is correct around how it influences creativity and innovation. And I think all of these things are, are different taboo topics that we need to get up. So creating, uh, again, that psychological so safety in the organizations where we can talk about differences for men and women, just like we can talk about differences in mental health or physical capability or menstrual health issues, all the issues that tend to be taboo in organizations and talk about them in a more scientific and data-based way, then I think uh, we have the opportunity to take big strides forward in a short period of time. Could I take another issue, which is also, I think from a Swedish point of view, very important and, and should be a main, main issue for us. 
today 25% of the Swedish population are either not born in Sweden or have non-Swedish parents. Uh, should, uh, should the minority diversity, I mean, should we have they had too strong focus on gender and less on sort of general minority diversity? Uh, and what can we learn from the US? It's a very different culture, very different uh, history, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I would like to hear your comments on this. I mean, I think this is a main issue going forward is the sort of general minority issue. Not, not disregarding the gender issue, but I mean, there are other minority issues, especially in a country like Sweden, which has now changed tremendously over the last 30, 40 years. Who would like to kick off? Maybe Julie. I could start. Yeah, if you allow me. I, I do think it's a challenge. I think we need to be embracing every kind of diversity and inclusion. And yes, minority backgrounds are exactly that. I think this is harder culturally and we should admit it. But I, I have to tell you, if we looked back a hundred years ago, they would have said the same about the women and we've gotten over that hump. This is something we need to address and we need to put plans in place. It goes into the point that we raised in the very beginning of this call about being inclusive and I pick up on the comment that Selena made, embracing our differences as a way to drive advantage, competitive advantage from a team perspective, but also from an overall company perspective. And I think that's going to require quite a bit of new thinking on this topic and us being willing to step over those unconscious biases of the past. Anyone else comment on the sort of minority diversity issue? Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, fully agree. Anna. I fully agree, and um, this is also, of course, again, a business opportunity that Sweden really hasn't capitalized on yet. We have started doing it from a gender perspective, but the next step is really to define those diversity dimensions that we can also start setting targets on. And as I said before, we have been a bit reluctant doing that because uh, we have. It's a different, you know cultural, uh, we come from a, you know, a, cult, a different cultural perspective in terms of measuring these areas, but we have to take those steps. And I think what's also important is that we have to also prepare the leaders in our organizations for leading diverse teams. It's a completely different thing. Uh, you need different kind of skill sets in order to lead individuals with different perspectives, different backgrounds. But if we have leaders with the right skills of doing that, you know, we can really, you know, unleash the full potential of these teams. Um, but that is also something that I think is very important as we go forward. It's not just about recruiting uh, and building diverse teams. It's also about really unleashing the potential of those teams, which is not always as easy if you have led very you know, homogenic teams all the time. Maria, you wanted to comment, I think. Yeah, and I think uh, for one thing, I mean, uh, as we talked in the beginning, to uh, to be part of, uh, a, you know, to be a big employer in a society and what can we actually do to help a society to be stable over time and so forth. So from that perspective, it's, it's also important uh, for us as a company. But, but I think also from the perspective that what we see now is that, you know, many competencies that we need specifically within our areas, they are, you know, fairly young and uh, they can't be found, for instance, in Sweden, or there are very few in the world. So that also makes us, uh, you know, we need to embrace uh, people from different backgrounds, different countries and so forth, whether we measure it or not, um, you know, we have some possibilities at least to measure what we stand towards the 25%, uh, but not uh, going, uh, you know, um, by the race or, or so forth. But, but I think we are forced to do that um, if we want to uh, be a successful company forward. And I think, you know, to add to that, you know, as leaders and organizations, sometimes I think we get preoccupied with having to have all the answers. Something that Ericsson is learning a lot is a, a long history of employee resource groups that we've had in, in the US for a long time. And how do we you know, transfer that to a more global level? You know, we're 100,000 employees in over 140 countries. And what is the different group within that respective geography that needs support? And what we've seen is if we're tapping into the collective intelligence of our employees, 
and giving them, you know, small, small budgets and uh, autonomy and authority to make decisions and come to leadership with recommendations. And if we actually listen to them about how to make it a more inclusive workplace, then we come also again, farther, faster, by just really, you know, using our incredible talent and the intelligence that we have in our organization, instead of trying to figure it all out at the center and, and thinking that we have all the answers. So I think really depending on the employees and the people that we're working with to actually come up with their own recommendations to represent them is, is a good way that, that we're experimenting with that, Ericsson. I have several questions from the audience that I'm trying to summarize. It touches upon this and it touches upon, I think, an issue that Anna raised earlier. The question really follows, when, when you manage sort of gender and minority diversity, should you use sort of a KPI system within, you know, to measure, because we learned whatever gets measured gets done, etc. cetera. How, how do you look at this and how, how, would it, how do you manage it? Anna, maybe you, you can start um, because I I'm think Genevieve is doing a bit of this, so. Yeah, sure. Yes, we measure everything. We measure everything both for, for Shinevik, but also for our portfolio companies and so that we can track progress, see, you know, where do we have gaps and how can we improve? And I think one measure, one KPI that is really good to always look at is uh, turnover, staff turnover, but not the usual staff turnover measurement, more looking into, you know, staff turnover among women on certain levels in the organization or um, in other areas, because then you are able to detect, you know, maybe there are in uh, one, one department or on one level when women are just reaching a certain seniority level, if they start to drop off and leave the company there, then you can quickly define and detect that you have maybe have a leadership issue or a cultural problem. So um, I think looking into uh, staff turnover and breaking that down into different diversity dimensions and on levels uh, really, really helps. So that's Anna, what you touched doing. upon that in Sweden, it's sometimes a bit sensitive sort of to measure certain things, while in the US, if we take that as an example, mm -hmm. they have a very different sort of view and culture and background, the history where they measure, you know, race, uh, religion, uh, all kinds of things that we, you know, in Sweden would be very difficult to talk about. I don't know if you have a comment on that or anyone else. I think it would be very difficult in, in a Swedish context to start uh, putting metrics on sexual orientation or uh, uh, race or, or, and so on. Uh, and it's, it's a very difficult road to take in a Swedish context. And I think it's important to highlight the differences in the history and the culture between the US and, for example, Sweden or Northern Europe. But then, of course, it you know goes goes back to the question of leadership. How do you lead? How do you include include different perspectives? What are your own uh, biases or unconscious biases? But you know, to start putting metrics on on people in that way, uh, I think that's a, a difficult road to take in a Swedish context. Okay, we are getting a you know, to the uh, sort of we're at the end of our time. So I'm going to end this with a final question where I'm going to ask each one of you to highlight either one question you think should be discussed at a conference like this one and why it should be discussed and that we haven't discussed or give, or you could also give an example from your own company how you deal with this issue. So please feel free and sort of make a final statement that you would like the audience to, to get to know. So maybe we start with Viveka, since you are on the left side from me, I see you. So, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really want to highlight the importance of promoting different perspectives, different experiences, different competences. And really this, you know, the different mindset, because that, that is a business issue. It drives the long-term competitiveness. And then we have to find ways of doing that. We do, one way we do it is by measuring sense of belonging, sense of inclusion among our own employees. And we urge our companies to do the same. 
to really drive diversity and inclusion. Maria? We don't hear you. Now you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, at least uh, what we can see, you know, how can you actually drive change? Because at least I see this as a culture change. Uh, that is a big part of it. And looking at, you know, how fast change we have seen in some areas in elections and so forth. But, but I think uh, it used to be the carrot and the stick. Uh, now we can see that it's actually moving to, to make it easy versus hard. And if you can make it effortless for people to do the right thing, I think uh, you can also uh, have a progress that is a bit faster. So that's my Thank you. loss. Yes. Selina, some final words? <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, I think uh, some of this I've said before, but I think, you know, we, somebody touched on unconscious bias and we spend a lot of time training people on conscious bias. But what we really know, actually, what actually works now from the science is that we need to de-bias the organizations. We need to de-bias our processes, our ways of working, and fundamentally how we're assessing people. So if we're getting at those policies and governance uh, models, that's a key piece. If we talked about setting goals, but if there are goals with no consequences and no accountability held, then they're meaningless. So the power of having those KPIs with actual consequences. And then finally, this is a culture issue, right? So if we're not actually addressing the behavioral science, looking at the data, looking at the correlation between the data and what's really happening instead of making assumptions about why some group is leaving or staying, then, then we're actually missing the mark and we're interjecting solutions that are not solving the true problem. So I think it is about debiancing organizations and really making sure that as, as we're role modeling and thinking about representation, you know, there's, there's a quote by, I, I think it's a woman who's the founder of the Children's Defense Fund. She said, you can't be what you can't see. So I would, I would wrap up saying that I love the passion on the board and I, I appreciate your passion in terms of facilitating, but it's action that yields results for most things and definitely in this space. Absolutely, agree. Julie, please. Such great comments from everyone. I, I would maybe leave you with three thoughts if I could. Please don't think that diversity inclusiveness is that nice soft topic. It's really critical for performance. Number two, I think it's something that everyone has a part to play. This is not just tone at the top from the CEO, but everyone, when we hire someone, when we work in a team, when we promote someone, has a role to play to making sure that we're making sure everyone feels like they belong and everybody has a spot, whether you can measure it or not. Now, I do encourage the measurement for that what we can see and what we're legally allowed to. And I agree with Vivek, that's not everything. But I think we've got to move in that direction about taking accountability, responsibility for action on the things that we can. But I'd leave you with my third thought. I know that 80% of this might be by women, but I do hope that by seeing the passion and the energy, we can inspire a few men and women out there to take the action needed to have an impact. So Gabrielle, thank you very much for all of your great moderation and facilitation. And thank you. Thanks Anna. to the great panelists. Thanks, thanks. Anna, please, you find, you end this sort of. <laughs> okay. Well, one question that I sometimes miss in uh, seminars like this is how do you inject DNI in a concrete way into your behaviors, into your work streams, and into your processes of the organization? Because in order to answer that question, you, you have to become very concrete in what you actually do. And for us, it has been important, for example, to scrutinize each and every process that we have in the organization. And our investment process is the heart of what we do at Chinevik. So when we scrutinize that process, we understood and realized, you know, that we can have such a big impact from a DNI perspective if we set clear targets on the share of um, how big 
percentage of our capital that should be invested in female founders. Um, if we don't invest or give do follow-ons in companies that don't have a very proactive and clear DNI agenda, that is also a great way of having a, an impact uh, on the on the society and on the companies that we invest in. So by really, really working on our invest in investment process and doing a very detailed people and cultural and DNI due diligence on the companies that we evaluate, um, that also changes the behaviors of the employees in our organization, which also affects our DNA as a company. And that's how we can change long term. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We are now almost 4.15. I would first of all like to thank the outstanding panel and the activity and it's really been most interesting and I really appreciate having shared this uh, with this great group of people answering and discussing. So thanks a lot to the panel. It's been, at least for me, very valuable and I hope the audience feel the same. I also would like to say to the audience that we have received many, many questions that we unfortunately <laughs> don't have the time to, to, to answer. So, uh, you know, excuse us for that, but it's just the shortage of time. Hopefully this will be followed up by other webinars or seminars. So thanks a lot. Take care and uh, let's work on these issues. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.